Is it actually possible to prevent Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases, or is that just a lie? Well, most people would tell you no, that there's no way of avoiding it, but that's really not the case anymore. So newer evidence has come out, and we've found ways that you can not only slow down Alzheimer's, but potentially prevent it altogether. So researchers in Finland actually did a two-year randomized controlled trial in 2015. So they had over 1,200 people between the ages of 60 and 77, and they all had a higher risk of getting dementia. So they had two groups. The first group was a control group, and they just received general health advice for the two years. And the other group had a two-year program involving diet, exercise, cognitive training, and vascular risk monitoring. They found that the group that had the interventions for two years, they were able to significantly reduce cognitive decline and also maintain cognitive function. So we can definitely do things to prevent or at least slow the progression of these neurodegenerative diseases. And in this case, those people were already pretty old and they were already at a higher risk of getting dementia. And this is very promising because what if we instead start these measures when people are very young? Because when do people normally catch Alzheimer's? The early clinical stages of Alzheimer's, which is also known as mild cognitive impairment, is when you start to notice symptoms that go beyond occasional lapses and forgetfulness to noticeable memory problems, such as forgetting common words and frequently losing important objects. And another sign is when you frequently forget your passwords. But dementia actually begins way earlier than when these symptoms first start to appear. This large 2011 analysis of data from the UK's Whitehall II cohort study found that more subtle signs of cognitive changes often become apparent well before patients get these symptoms of the mild cognitive impairment. This is called stage one preclinical Alzheimer's. So basically these are some symptoms that become apparent before even those first mild symptoms start to appear. So this shows that dementia can progress unnoticed for many years before even those first symptoms appear. And the same is actually true for other neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's as well, but they all have different warning signs. Now how would you really know if you or someone else has these earliest of early warning signs. Well, this is when you would really need to go to a specialist, like a neurologist, and get actual testing done. Because really, it's so hard to test for these diseases at this early of a stage that you need a specialist to be there. And one reason that diseases like Alzheimer's are so hard to test in the beginning is because our brains are able to compensate for damage. And in doing so, our brain can basically conceal the early signs of neurodegeneration. Whenever we have a thought or a certain perception, there's not just one neural pathway that's working. There's actually many different pathways that are working. And the pathway that's firing the most is the one that's going to form that thought or perception. And this is according to Francisco Gonzalez Lima, who is a neuroscientist at the University of Texas in Austin. So the theory is that the more of these connections that we build up through our lifetime, whether it's through learning a new language or learning different instruments or learning different complex skills, that the more cognitive reserve that we have. And this will therefore prevent us from getting Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases. But also, if we do get those diseases, it'll delay the progression of those diseases. And it's actually a similar concept with Parkinson's disease. But Parkinson's, on the other hand, is more of a movement disorder. So instead of needing this cognitive reserve, you need more of a movement reserve. So in this case, people who have better movement patterns or a longer history of actually moving their bodies, like trained athletes, will have a slower progression of Parkinson's disease. And actually, out of all the interventions for Parkinson's disease, exercising is the only one that has shown to slow the progression of it. Now, the other benefit you get from exercise is that it helps maintain glucose homeostasis, and it also helps improve the health of your vasculature. So when focusing on exercising, one key type of exercise to focus on is zone two cardio. So I actually make other videos where I talk about zone two training specifically. So if you wanna learn more information about that, I'm putting a link in the description below. But the main benefit you get from zone two training is you improve your mitochondrial efficiency. Or in other words, you improve the health of your mitochondria and you also make them work more efficiently to produce energy better. So in a nutshell, zone two cardio is a type of cardio exercise where you can maintain for a longer period of time. So if you're going out for a jog, something that you can do for a long time, it's not like doing an all out sprint. So a good gauge to test if you're in zone two or not is to see if you can have a full conversation with someone, but that conversation is still a little strained. So if you're having a really easy conversation with someone, then you're most likely in zone one. 
But if you're not able to maintain a full conversation, then you're probably entering zone three or zone four. Now, strength training is also just as important. So this study was looking at nearly half a million patients in the United Kingdom. And they found that grip strength, which is an excellent indicator for your overall strength, was strongly and inversely associated with getting dementia. Actually, people in the lowest quartile of their grip strength, so the weakest people, had a 72% higher risk of getting dementia compared to people in the highest quartile of grip strength. And the authors also found that this association was still true when they accounted for a lot of other variables. These were things like age, sex, socioeconomic status, diseases such as diabetes and cancer, smoking, and lifestyle factors such as sleep patterns, walking pace, and time spent watching TV. And also, there appeared to be no upper limit or no plateauing of this pattern. So, in other words, the higher that someone's grip strength would be, no matter how high it was, the lower their risk of getting dementia. Now, out of all the things that you're gonna be doing to prevent getting Alzheimer's and prevent this neurodegeneration, exercising is by far the number one thing that you can do. Now, what are some other ways to prevent getting dementia? Well, the next step would be to address any metabolic issues. In a nutshell, just keep in mind that whatever is good for the heart and whatever is good for the liver is also good for the brain. If you're improving any metabolic disorders, then you're also gonna be improving your glucose metabolism, and you're also gonna be lowering your inflammation and oxidative stress. So one simple way to do this is to switch to a Mediterranean diet. So in this case, you'll be focusing on eating more of these monounsaturated fats and eating less refined carbs. You can also focus on eating more fatty fish because there's some evidence that supplementing with omega-3 DHAs, which is found in fish oil, has been shown to improve the health of your brain. There's also some evidence on switching to a ketogenic diet. So this systematic review of randomized control trials found that ketogenic therapies improved general cognition and memory in subjects with mild cognitive impairment and early stage Alzheimer's disease. Another powerful tool to prevent Alzheimer's is getting enough sleep. Think of sleep as our brain's time to heal itself. And when you're sleeping, your brain is essentially cleaning itself and it's getting rid of this intercellular waste. Now, if you have poor sleep and you combine it with higher stress and higher cortisol levels, this will multiply your risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. And this will also contribute to insulin resistance, which will also make you more likely to have metabolic disorder. Also, if you're super stressed and you have hypercortisolemia or excess cortisol from being too stressed out, then this is gonna impair your release of melatonin, which is your primary sleep hormone, which is gonna basically throw your sleep off and then make this a never ending cycle. Now, we also have some evidence that hearing loss is actually causally linked with Alzheimer's, meaning that hearing loss can potentially eventually cause Alzheimer's disease. One theory behind this is because people tend to pull back and withdraw from different interactions when they can't hear properly. So when you do this, your brain is getting derived from all of these inputs. And not having as many inputs means that your brain will eventually decline. Now there's still more studies being done on this, so we're still waiting on the evidence to come. This is more of just a hypothesis right now. Also, another thing you really wanna start focusing on is brushing and flossing. Yes, your oral health matters too. The main thing here is you want to reduce systemic inflammation. When you have gum disease buildup, then you have these bacteria that get into your bloodstream and it can cause this inflammation throughout your body. And we have a huge link between gum disease and Alzheimer's and other diseases as well. And what's more interesting is this microbe that causes gum disease, P. gingivalis, this same microbe has shown up in the brains of people that have Alzheimer's disease. Now, does P. gingivalis and this gum disease cause Alzheimer's? Well, we don't know whether or not it causes it yet, but there's too much of a link to ignore it. Because having a healthy mouth doesn't just correlate with lower risk of Alzheimer's, it also correlates with less heart disease, less risk of diabetes, and other diseases as well. So the simplest thing you can start doing is brushing twice a day and flossing once a day. And also going to your dentist every six months. Now the last thing I wanted to talk about is using the sauna. Now you might not think that using a sauna will really make a difference in getting cognitive decline, but this study found that people who do moderate to high frequency of sauna bathing was associated with a lower risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Now, part of the reason behind this could have been explained in the study. They basically said that poor vascular function and vascular disease may be associated with worse cognitive performance and dementia. So in other words, if you improve your circulatory function and the health of your heart, 
then this can also lower your risk of getting dementia. And this makes sense because we kind of mentioned this earlier too, that anything that benefits the heart, anything that benefits the liver, anything that benefits your metabolism is gonna eventually benefit your brain. Also, the other benefit you get from going to the sauna is you get to relax and it's good for your well-being. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a sauna, but something that lowers your stress is gonna help as well. But this other study that was published in JAMA really shows the benefits that specifically using a sauna can have on your heart. They found that increased frequency of sauna bathing was associated with the reduced risk of heart disease and all-cause mortality. Now, getting dementia or Alzheimer's or other types of neurodegenerative diseases are clearly multifactorial. But it seems like we have a lot of ways that are not proven necessarily, but will definitely lower your risk of getting Alzheimer's or at least delay the progression of your Alzheimer's disease. One other important thing to note is time is key here. The earlier you start to treat yourself and prevent yourself from getting Alzheimer's, the better. You don't wanna wait until someone actually has symptoms to start treating or preventing Alzheimer's disease. Because the thing with Alzheimer's is once it is diagnosed, it's nearly impossible to slow the progression of it or even prevent it at all. Now, some other things that will also be helpful in preventing any sort of cognitive decline would be treating depression and also hormone replacement therapy in women, especially as they're going through menopause. Also getting enough B vitamins, enough omega-3 fatty acids, and enough vitamin D. When it comes to trying to live longer, there's a lot of information out there that is contraindicating. Eat more red meat, eat more eggs, stop eating plants. No, stop eating red meat. In fact, stop eating meat in general. Only eat plants. When it comes to the best way to ensure that you are gonna live longer, my advice is stop worrying so much about